reading. It's something that you and I kind of take for granted because we're, well, just so used to it. And because it's such a common, everyday, basic skill, it can be easy to forget how crippling it would be if you couldn't read. We just kind of take it for granted. But the printed word is nothing short of revolutionary. So here's what I want to look at today. Literacy is such an important part of what it means to live an authentic human life that I'm convinced that you and I, well, we were actually designed to read and write. Stick around. I'll show you what I mean. In the pages of the New Testament, we have copies of these ancient letters, and some of them are written to entire church groups, and others were written to specific individuals. And in one of the two letters that we have from Paul to Timothy, there's one brief statement that has always made me, well, pretty happy. It's almost a, a throwaway, a sidebar, something that doesn't even add to the core subject of Paul's letter. And it's this, it's found in 2 Timothy chapter 4, and this was written while Paul was in prison waiting for the end of his life. Here's what it says, beginning in verse 11. Only Luke is with me, so we can see Paul is by himself. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. And Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. So, we can see that even though Paul is a prisoner and his life is almost over, he's still completely occupied with his work as an apostle. Verse 13, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas when you come. So, probably getting cold. Now, here comes the part that I really love. He says, and the books, especially the parchments. Now, I don't know about you, but that really rings my bell. There have been these times when I've been overseas in a country where I don't really speak the language. And, and after a few weeks, I run out of stuff to read. And of course, I'm going back in history here, and I'm talking about a time before ebooks and Kindles when you couldn't bring a thousand titles along in your pocket. Those last few weeks of having nothing to read, well, it drives me nuts. Reading is my life. So, I can identify with Paul, a man who loves to study and wishes he had some of his favorite books. And, and the fact that his life is about to end is really, really interesting to me because, well, why in the world would you bother enriching your mind and learning stuff when it's just about lights out? It doesn't make sense unless you happen to believe there's more to human existence than the few short years we get from cradle to grave. So here's what I want you to think about today. Why is it that we have a love for things like reading and learning? Where in the world did that impulse come from? I mean, if, if we choose to believe the story of human origins that we were taught in school, this drive to learn doesn't really make a lot of sense. I mean, they say that way back when we didn't have tools and we had to discover them. As if one day some primate suddenly realized you can pry open a clamshell twice as fast if you use a stick. And then another primate, hundreds of thousands of years later, suddenly discovers you can kill another monkey much faster if you use a rock instead of your fist. They also say that once upon a time, we didn't have any real language ability. And we had to communicate like animals by grunting, and shoving, and pushing, and maybe eventually by using clicks and whistles and assembling a crude vocabulary of just a couple hundred sounds. But what if that's not true? What if the human race came into existence already bearing all the marks of intelligence? I mean, as far as you can call human beings intelligent, that is. Now, I know that what I'm going to say isn't what you learned in your high school biology book, but I want you to think about this for a moment. And if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. 
But if you and I are just animals and we happen to evolve by accident, then why in the world would we ever develop things like intellectual curiosity? I mean, it makes perfect sense that we might develop key survival skills like hunting or farming or simple shelter building, but why would we develop things like aesthetically pleasing architecture or the symphonies of Gustav Mahler or a curiosity about why we're here, why we exist. Why do you and I have a love for thinking? Why do we find technical manuals kind of boring, but at the same time, we relish the words of a really great writer, a person who has the ability to paint mental pictures using the sounds of language? Why did things like poetry and drama matter so much to the ancient classical civilizations. What sense does it make to develop a love for beautiful things? Would that really be an accident of biology? Or is it possible that the human race was designed on purpose with a much higher calling than basic animal existence? Did somebody make us this way? Now, in, in the interest of full disclosure, just so you know what my personal preferences and biases are, I, I happen to love books. And over the last few decades, I've quite literally collected thousands of them. Just ask my wife. They are scattered all over the house. And to make things worse, my wife has the same affliction. There's probably not a single room in our house anymore that doesn't have stacks of books scattered all over it, including well, that little room where you only read for a few minutes at a time if you get my drift. We have books everywhere. So I'm coming at this subject from my own little book permeated bubble. That's my bias. And it occurs to me that there must be a, a reason I love all those books. There must be a reason that you love them too. I mean, where did you get that impulse? Now, I know that some people might explain this as a product of your childhood environment. I mean, this is something that my parents engraved in my heart and mind. And I've got to admit, that's a big part of what's going on in my life. I really did grow up in a house full of books. And if you were born in the Western world, I'm pretty sure that you were encouraged to read too, because, well, that's what most parents want for their kids. It almost starts the day that you're born. You get alphabet books and Books that feature, well, one single letter per page like this Dr. Seuss classic about the alphabet. Maybe you had this book as a kid. I know I, I did. And, and, and then you watch TV shows like Sesame Street, where the letters come to life with the support of Kermit and Grover, and they help you pronounce the sounds that letters make and help you slowly put two parts of a word together until they become one word. Do you remember this one? K at cat, cat, you remember this. Most of us are completely immersed in the world of reading and writing from about the time we draw our first breath. So yes, it's possible that the drive to read is a learned habit, but I still suspect there's something more to this, that reading and writing weren't just evolutionary accidents, but a key part of what it means to be an authentic human being. So, if you just hang in there for a moment while we take a break and share some great stuff from the good people at The Voice of Prophecy, I'll come right back to tell you why. Here at The Voice of Prophecy, we're committed to creating top quality programming for the whole family, like our audio adventure series, Discovery Mountain. Discovery Mountain is a Bible-based program for kids of all ages and backgrounds. Your family will enjoy the faith-building stories from this small mountain summer camp and town. With 24 seasonal episodes every year and fresh content every week, there's always a new adventure just on the horizon. Are you searching for answers to life's toughest questions like, where is God when we suffer? Can I find real happiness? Or is there any hope for our chaotic world? The Discover Bible Guides will help you find the answers you're looking for. Visit us at BibleStudies.com or give us a call at 888-456-7933 for your free Discover Bible Guides. Study online on our secure website or have the free guides mailed right to your home. There is never a cost or obligation. The Discover Bible Guides are our free gift to you. 
Find answers in guides like, Does My Life Really Matter to God? and A Second Chance at Life. You'll find answers to the things that matter most to you in each of the 26 Discover Bible Guides. Visit BibleStudies.com and begin your journey today to discover answers to life's deepest questions. There, there's just something about this whole phenomenon of reading and writing that intrigues me deeply. This human impulse that we have to seek out knowledge and grow our body of knowledge and then preserve that knowledge. Well, I, I can't stop thinking about this. Where in the world did we get this impulse? Now, I know there are still some non-literate cultures in this world who resort to an oral tradition. And I don't want to discount that because well, people immersed in oral traditions, frankly, have better memories than we do because, well, they have to. They pass down their stories and knowledge, usually the same thing. They pass them down from generation to generation by memorizing them. So some scholars believe that an oral culture keeps your brain a little healthier because you can't rely on some exterior implement to help you remember things. You and I aren't that good at memorizing anymore, especially now that we can just go and Google anything we need to know. We don't memorize. Let's get back to literate cultures, which have dominated the world now for thousands of years. In the beginning was the Word, the Gospel of John tells us, and one of the most breathtaking passages in the Bible. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, to be honest, our English version of that sentence is probably a bad translation of the original Greek, where the word for word is logos. And it might be a better translation to say, in the beginning was the wisdom, or in the beginning was the principle that holds the universe together, or something like that. The idea behind this passage is a recognition that the universe we inhabit is a logical, organized place. Somebody made this universe on purpose, and it has order and logic and a huge degree of predictability. In fact, this Greek word logos is where we get our English word logic. Now, the reason it says word in the English translation is because back in the fourth century, a church father by the name of Jerome decided to translate the Bible from Greek and Hebrew, which are the original biblical languages, into Latin, the official language of the Roman Church. And when he translated this word logos in the Gospel of John, he used the Latin verbum, where you and I get words like verbal and verbose. It simply means word. But by choosing this Latin word verbum, Jerome kind of stripped the original Greek of a lot of impact, which is unfortunate because logos has many layers of meaning. Now, apart from that, this is still a pretty good translation. So let me read it again, this time in context. This is John chapter 1, starting in verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Now, we could probably spend a couple of hours unpacking what we just read because there's a lot of information there. But let me just point out a couple of important ideas. First of all, this is obviously talking about the act of creation because it mentions a person who made everything. And it says that person is also God. And there is nothing in existence that God didn't make. Then, secondly, I want you to notice that this opening passage in John's Gospel clearly echoes one of the most famous passages in the Bible, which comes from Genesis chapter 1. So now let's go back and read that for the sake of comparison, because I have little doubt that John was deliberately steering us here. So here we go now, Genesis chapter 1, and I really want you to pay attention to the parallels. Verse 1, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. So we have the same event, the creation of the world, recorded in two different places. And in one of those places, it tells us that the Word, the Logos, created the universe. In the other place, it tells us God spoke the universe into existence. So, in other words, 
The Creator is somebody who speaks. I know that seems self-evident, but this is important. What you have throughout the story of the Bible is not some abstract, impersonal deity, a cosmic energy field like the Force out of Star Wars. What you have is a distinctive God with a detectable personality, and He speaks His creation into existence, and then He goes on speaking to His creation. To borrow the words of the late Francis Schaeffer, God is there, and He is not silent. So, what, what we have in this book is a God who communicates. And then in Genesis 1 verse 26 it says this, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in His own image. In the image of God He created him, male and female, He created them. So, according to this account, you and I were made in the image of God, and people have been wrestling with what that means, being made in the image of God for thousands of years. It might, in part, be pointing to our love for creativity, or more likely, it might be pointing to the fact that you and I have been given things like moral choice and freedom of thought, which is a reflection of what God is like. Today, though, I'm going to add one more thought to the realm of possibility, one more way that you and I are made in God's image. If God is somebody who loves to communicate, who loves to speak, then it's probably not an accident that human beings love to communicate, too, because we were made in His image. We are not God, but we are like Him. And I realize that I'm opening a big can of worms here, and there's not a chance I can unpack what I'm going to talk about in the time we have left, but one of the points of this program is, frankly, to leave you with something to think about and explore. So maybe that's all I'm going to get done today. Let me show you something really interesting in the opening pages of the Bible, again from the book of Genesis, which is the Bible's book of origins. So it's a pretty foundational part of the Scriptures. In Genesis chapter 4, we have Cain and Abel, the children of Adam and Eve, and it tells us Cain was a vegetable farmer and Abel raised sheep. So we have a record of the beginnings of agriculture and animal husbandry. We can see why we continue to live the way we do today. Then, after that, we have an account of urbanization. You have Cain building a city in Genesis chapter 4, and then Nimrod, I know it's a funny name, but Nimrod, who is the biblical Gilgamesh, he goes out and builds a whole bunch of cities in the land of Shinar, which is roughly where modern-day Iraq is. And among those early cities, we have a few well-known centers of influence, like Babel, which becomes Babylon, and Nineveh, which becomes the capital of the Assyrian Empire. And interestingly enough, there's, there's another city mentioned here called Erech, which is probably where the name for modern-day Iraq comes from. So what we have is the beginning of urbanization. Then. In the second half of Genesis chapter 4, we get the story of Cain's descendants, and it tells us about some of their accomplishments. So here it is, beginning in Genesis 4 and verse 16, and we'll read quite a bit of this. Verse 16, Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. Now we should probably come back and look at that again someday because there's some really profound information there, but let's just go on. Verse 17, and Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch, and he built a city. So we have the first mention of a city, and it's not a good thing, not according to this. And called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. Then we get a bunch of genealogy. So let's just jump down to verse 20. Not that the genealogy is not important, it is, but let's get on to verse 20. And Ada bore Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. So we have the first nomads. You can still find their descendants today, like, well, the Bedouins in the Middle East, verse 21. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the harp and flute. Birth of music, verse 22. And as for Zillah, she also bore Tubal Cain, an instructor of every craftsman in bronze and iron. So now we get metalworking. And then it finishes by saying this And the sister of Tubal Cain was Nama. Traditionally, according to legend, Nama is Noah's wife. So, here we have the birth of cities, and the birth of agriculture, and keeping livestock, and the birth of the arts, and the birth of metalworking, and all of these are obviously important stepping stones in the development of human civilization. 
But notice what's missing. It's the birth of writing. And that was such a profound development, you'd think somebody would take the time to explain how we got it, but it's not in here. We don't get the name of the first person to write or the person who invented the alphabet. It's not in here. And I've got to wonder why. It's almost like the ability to read and write, to communicate with organized language is just assumed. Now, when you and I look back over history, we can see the obvious development of the art of writing, from the pictographs of the cave dwellers to the hieroglyphs of Egypt and the pictographs of China and the early Phoenicians and the Greeks and the Hebrews. There's a definite progression to how people learn to preserve their important ideas on clay or stone or paper. But the Bible doesn't mention it. So why is that important? Well, I'll be right back to tell you. Life can throw a lot at us. Sometimes we don't have all the answers. But that's where the Bible comes in. It's our guide to a more fulfilling life. Here at The Voice of Prophecy, we've created the Discover Bible Guides to be your guide to the Bible. They're designed to be simple, easy to use, and provide answers to many of life's toughest questions. And they're absolutely free. So jump online now or give us a call and start your journey of discovery. A world without writing would be a tough place to live because we wouldn't be able to transmit our ideas across time and space. Writing is easily one of the most important developments we've ever had, and yet this book of origins doesn't explain where it comes from. In fact, in the very opening scenes, you have God just talking to Adam, apparently without any need for education. And you have Adam naming animals, a task that requires, well, considerable linguistic ability. You've got the story of the Tower of Babel, which provides an explanation for the diversity of language, but even then, everybody's already speaking a perfectly formed language. The Bible just assumes that language has always been there. So, what if that's true? That's not to say that language doesn't change, it obviously does. And the minute a language stops changing, it dies like Latin. Historically, we can see how a language changes or grows, but Try to explain where it started and the trail runs cold. And of course, if you're trying to tell the story of how we communicate and you go back to a time before we started writing, well, that trail runs cold. It would be a tough job anyway. Look, I don't want to be too dogmatic about this because I only ever took rudimentary linguistic classes. And I know there are people who have devoted their lives to explaining language from a naturalistic point of view. And some of you who did that are cringing and probably busy writing me letters, which is kind of ironic. The idea that language, the way people use it, is an accident of evolution, I find that unsatisfactory because you and I obviously use language in ways that well, have very little to do with survival of the fittest. I'm not convinced that language just evolved. It would mean that human consciousness just somehow accidentally emerged out of a bunch of dead matter in the universe. You and I use language to inspire each other, to generate emotions. We use language to manipulate people and to motivate and even to help us perfect the art of romance. I mean, thank you, Lord Byron, for helping me land a wife. We love to read books that are well written just for the sake of beautiful writing, and I have a bunch of those in my library. It suggests that language isn't about survival, it's a gift from a God who loves to communicate. It's a tool we were given to help us satisfy intellectual curiosity so that we could explore where we come from and think about where we're going, and most importantly, contemplate the meaning of our existence. It's as if somebody deliberately equipped us for more than just survival. Consider the fact that writing has taken many forms across many cultures, but the most efficient ones, the ones that have been used most consistently, are rooted in the story of the Bible. The Egyptians had pictographs, and the Chinese had masterful calligraphy, but back in those days, literacy was the privilege of very few people because learning to read was expensive and complicated. Then somebody invented the alphabet, where individual letters represent sounds instead of concepts, and now you can actually record millions of concepts with just a handful of symbols that anybody can learn. We called it the alphabet. 
And the alphabet was probably invented by the same people who gave us this book because, well, the word alphabet is a compound word. It's Aleph and Bet, the first two letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Or to be more precise, it's actually the first two letters of the Greek alphabet, Alpha and Beta. But we're going to give credit to the Hebrews because the Greeks got it from them. So the gift of writing was essentially a Semitic invention, an efficient system of communication that was used by Hebrews and Phoenicians and Canaanites, and they passed it down to us. Now, I got to take one last break, but don't you go anywhere. Dragons, beasts, cryptic statues. Bible prophecy can be incredibly vivid and confusing. If you've ever read Daniel or Revelation and come away scratching your head, you're not alone. Our free Focus on Prophecy guides are designed to help you unlock the mysteries of the Bible and deepen your understanding of God's plan for you and our world. Study online or request them by mail and start bringing prophecy into focus today. When, when you read the Bible from cover to cover, you quickly discover, as Rabbi Jonathan Sachs once pointed out, it's not the story of people talking about God, it's actually the story of people talking to God. And at the same time, it's the story of God talking to people. This is not just a database, a collection of information. The authors who wrote this book said it was the Word of God. And these words represent an effort by God to communicate with us. Consider the fact that no pack of dogs, no herd of pigs, no flock of sparrows has ever done what you and I just did. We communicated about the past, the present, and the future. We took abstract ideas and put them into words. And we transmitted those words over thousands of miles so that you and I can understand each other. Something has been driving us since day one to converse with each other just for the sake of sharing ideas, just for the sake of talking. And today I submit to you that the reason we do this is because we were put here by a God who thinks and communicates and speaks. And the reason God speaks is because He's a God of relationships. And He hardwired you and me to be just like Him, made in His image. Pick up a book, read through the words, Think about what you're seeing and think about the phenomenon. Where did we pick up this desire? Is it really an accident that we love to think and communicate? I'm Sean Boonstrom, and this has been Authentic. Mm -hmm.